Magic Tree House, Book Number Thirty Eight, A Merlin Mission, Monday with a Mad Genius, Chapter One, Old Friends. Jack poured milk over his cereal. His stomach felt fluttery. It was Monday, the first day of a new school year. Jack always felt nervous on the first day. What would his new teacher be like? Would his desk be close to a window? Would friends from last year be in his class again this year? Annie, hurry! Jack's mom called upstairs. It's fifteen minutes till eight. School starts in half an hour. Jack's dad walked into the kitchen. Are you sure you and Danny don't want me to drive you? He asked. No thanks. We don't mind walking," said Jack. Their school was only three blocks away. Annie, hurry! Their mom called again. You're going to be late. The back door banged open. Annie rushed into the kitchen. She was out of breath. Oh, I thought you were upstairs. Their mom said with surprise. You were outside. Yes," said Annie, panting. Just taking a quick walk. She looked at Jack. Her eyes sparkled. "Hurry, Jack! We really should go now." "Okay, I'm coming," said Jack. He leapt up from the table. He could tell Annie wasn't talking about school. The treehouse must be back, finally. Jack grabbed his backpack. Annie held the door open for him. "No breakfast?" their mom asked. "Too nervous to eat now, Mom," said Jack. "Me too," said Annie. Bye, mom. Bye, dad. Have fun, their mom said. Learn a lot, said their dad. Don't worry, we will, said Annie. Jack and Danny slipped out the door and walked quickly across their yard. It's back, said Annie. I figured it was, said Jack. Morgan must want us to look for another secret of happiness to help Merlin, said Annie. Yep, said Jack. Let's run. Jack and Danny dashed up the sidewalk. They crossed the street and headed into the Frog Creek woods. They ran between the trees, through shadows and light, until they came to the tallest oak. High in the tree was the magic tree house. The rope ladder was swaying in the chilly morning wind. "How did you know it was here?" asked Jack, catching his breath. "I woke up thinking about Teddy and Kathleen," said Annie. And I had this strange feeling. Really? said Jack. Teddy, Kathleen, he shouted up at the treehouse. Two young teenagers looked out the treehouse window. A curly-haired boy with freckles and a big grin, and a smiling girl with sea blue eyes and dark wavy hair. Jack, Annie, the girl said. Come up, come up, said the boy. Jack and Annie hurried up the rope ladder. When they climbed inside the treehouse, they threw their arms around their friends. "Are we going to look for another secret of happiness?" said Annie. "To help Merlin?" "Yes, and this time you will travel back to Florence, Italy, five hundred years ago," said Teddy. "Florence, Italy?" said Jack. "What's there?" "An amazing person who will help you," said Kathleen. "Who?" asked Annie. Is this person magical? Teddy grinned. Some people might say so, he said. He reached into his cloak and pulled out a book. The cover showed a drawing of a man wearing a purple cloak and floppy blue cap. He had a long nose, bright, kind eyes with heavy eyebrows, and a flowing beard. The title said, "Leonardo da Vinci." Leonardo da Vinci said, "Jack, are you kidding?" I've heard of him," said Annie. "Who hasn't?" said Jack. "He was an incredible genius." "This biography of Leonardo will help you on your mission," said Teddy. "And so will this rhyme from Morgan," said Kathleen. She pulled a small piece of parchment paper from her cloak and gave it to Annie. Annie read the words on the paper aloud. "Jack and Annie of Frog Creek." Though the question is quite simple, simple answers might be wrong. If you want to know the right one, help the genius all day long, morning, noon, and afternoon, till the night bird sings its song. 
So to find the secret of happiness, we need to spend the whole day helping Leonardo da Vinci, said Jack. Yes, said Kathleen. Teddy nodded. I wish you could come too, said Annie. And help us, said Jack. Never fear, said Kathleen. You will have the help of the great genius and the wand of Dianthus. Oh, Annie said to Jack, did you bring our wand? Of course, said Jack. I always carry it with me for safekeeping. He reached into his backpack and pulled out a gleaming silver wand. The wand of Dianthus, Teddy said in a hushed voice. The wand looked like the horn of a unicorn. It burned in Jack's hand with cold or warmth. He couldn't tell which. He carefully put the wand back into his pack. Remember the three rules of the wand, said Kathleen. Sure, said Annie. You can only use it for the good of others. You can only use it after you've tried your hardest. And you can only use it with the command of five words. Excellent, said Kathleen. Thanks, said Annie. Ready? she asked Jack. Jack nodded. Bye, Teddy. Bye, Kathleen. Goodbye, said Teddy. And good luck, said Kathleen. Jack pointed at the cover of the book. I wish we could go to Leonardo da Vinci. In the distance, the school bell started to ring, letting kids know that school would start in ten minutes. But in the Frog Creek woods, the wind started to blow. The treehouse started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still. Absolutely still. Chapter 2. Looking for Leonardo. A different bell was bonging in the distance. Bright early sunlight poured through the treehouse window. Teddy and Kathleen were gone. Jack looked down at his clothes. He was wearing a knee-length tunic and dark tights. Annie wore a long dress with puffy sleeves. Jack's backpack had changed into a cloth bag. Jack and Annie looked out the window. The treehouse had landed in a tall tree in a garden surrounded by green hedges. Beyond the garden was a sea of red-tiled roofs. A huge eight-sided dome and a stone tower rose high above the red rooftops. Welcome to Florence, Italy, said Annie. Jack opened their book and read aloud. In the early 1500s, many artists and craftspeople lived in the city of Florence. The city was filled with silk weavers, potters, and marble workers. Artists made sculptures, paintings, and tapestries. Cool, said Annie. I love art. Jack read more. But the most amazing genius of that time did a bit of everything. Leonardo da Vinci was not only a great painter, but also an inventor, architect, stage and costume designer, horseman, chef, geologist, and botanist. What's a geologist and a botanist? said Annie. They're scientists, said Jack. A geologist studies rocks, and a botanist studies plants. He turned to the page. Come on, we should go, said Annie. The treehouse probably brought us right to Leonardo. We have to find him before he gets away. Oh, right, said Jack. Annie started down the ladder. Jack packed up their research book and climbed down after her. Jack and Annie walked around the tall hedge and came to a busy road that ran along a river. They stared at all the people going by. There were women in long silk dresses, priests, in black robes riding donkeys, and soldiers in blue capes riding horses. I don't see anyone who looks like the guy on the cover of our book, said Jack. Let's ask someone, said Annie. She walked over to a girl selling flowers by the road. Excuse me, do you know a person named Leonardo da Vinci? Of course, everyone knows Leonardo, said the girl. He was just here. He bought some flowers from me. He said he was going to sketch them later. Her eyes shone with excitement. Where did he go? asked Jack. He headed toward the old bridge, the girl said. She pointed toward a covered bridge farther down the road. Thanks, said Annie. 
Jack and Danny walked quickly along the bank of the river toward the bridge. "You are right," said Jack. "The tree house brought us right to Leonardo." But while we were talking, he kept walking. "Don't worry," said Annie. "We'll catch up to him." The covered bridge was supported by three stone arches. It looked like a long house stretching over the river. As they crossed the bridge, it was hard to look for Leonardo. The light was dim, and the walkway beside the bridge was filled with people. Jack and Danny squeezed through the crowd to the other side of the bridge. The sunlight was so bright that Jack still couldn't see clearly. He shaded his eyes with his hand. "I still don't see him," he said. "We can ask again," said Annie. "That girl said everyone knows Leonardo. She headed to a shop near the river bank. Weavers were hanging colorful fabrics on a line. The red and purple silks waved in the breeze." "Excuse me," Annie called. Have you seen Leonardo da Vinci this morning? A toothless old woman smiled. Oh yes, Leonardo passed by only a moment ago. She said, on his way to the bakery, I think. She pointed down a narrow lane. He goes there every morning. Thanks," said Annie. Jack and Danny hurried to the bakery. The delicious smell of baking bread filled the air. Excuse me, did Leonardo da Vinci come in here? Jack asked. Yes, he just bought his daily loaf of bread," said the baker. He always goes to the cheese shop next. He pointed across the street. Thanks," said Jack. Jack and Danny crossed the busy street to the cheese shop. Is Leonardo da Vinci here?" asked Danny. He just left," said the cheese man. He pointed up the street. He was going to the blacksmith's. Oh, brother," said Jack. "Thanks," said Annie, and they headed up the street. "I can't wait to meet him," said Annie. "Me too," said Jack. "If we ever catch up to him." Loud hammering noises were coming from a shop. Jack and Annie looked inside and saw a blacksmith pounding a horseshoe with a huge iron hammer. A fire was roaring in a hearth nearby. Excuse me," Jack shouted. The burly man stopped pounding. "Was Leonardo da Vinci just here?" asked Jack. "Yes, he paid me for his iron pots," the blacksmith said gruffly. "Finally, do you know where he was going next?" asked Jack. "Headed for the market in a big hurry as usual," said the blacksmith, nodding toward the street. Then he went back to pounding. Jack and Danny ran up the street. They rounded a corner and stepped into a huge square. Sunlight shone down on hundreds of tents and stalls. The air smelled of fish and cinnamon and other spices. Oh man," said Jack, "it's huge!" The market was jam-packed with shoppers. It was hard to see over the heads of all the grown-ups. We could spend all day looking for Leonardo here," said Jack. "This is not good," said Annie. We're supposed to spend the day helping him, not looking for him. Remember the rhyme said, "Help the genius all day long, morning, noon, and afternoon, till the night bird sings its song." Yeah, whatever that means," said Jack. "Hey, maybe we should use the wand now," said Annie. "This situation fits the rules. Finding Leonardo is not just for our good; it's to help Merlin, and I think we've tried our hardest." Okay, let's use it. Jack slipped the wand of Danthus out of his bag and handed it to Annie. Five words, he said. I know, I know, she said. She held up the wand and counted her words on her fingers. Help us find Leonardo now. Jack and Annie held their breath and waited, but nothing changed. Everything around them looked exactly the same. It's not working, said Jack. What did we do wrong? I don't know," said Annie. "I used five words. It's definitely good for others. Maybe we haven't really tried our hardest yet." Jack signed. "Okay, let's keep trying." He took back the wand and slipped it into his bag. "Oh, look at the birds over there," said Annie. She pulled Jack over to a stall that sold caged birds. Only one bird was singing—a brown bird with a reddish tail. 
He was very plain, but he sang beautifully with whistles and trills. "Hi, you," said Annie. The bird tilted his head and looked straight at Annie. He chirped softly. "Come on, Annie. We can't waste time here," said Jack. "We have to keep looking for Leonardo." "But didn't you hear his song?" said Annie. "He wants to fly away. He wants to be free." Jack looked around for the bird seller. He was standing nearby, talking to a customer. "Forget it, Annie. We don't have money to pay for him," said Jack. "But he wants me to help him," said Annie. "I can feel it." She reached toward the cage door. "Annie, don't," said Jack. But Annie unlatched the door. The bird hopped onto the ground. "Oh no!" said Jack. He grabbed for the bird, but it was too late. The brown bird was already flying away into the blue sky. "Yay!" said Annie. "Hey!" shouted the bird seller, rushing over to them. "Were you trying to steal my bird?" "We weren't stealing him," said Annie. "We were setting him free." The bird seller grabbed Jack by the arm. "You'll have to pay for him then," he barked. "But, but," stammered Jack. "Marco, unhand that boy." A man's voice boomed. Jack turned to see a tall man in a purple cloak and floppy blue cap. He had a long nose, bright, kind eyes with heavy eyebrows, and a flowing beard. He looked exactly like the man on the cover of their book. Leonardo said, "Annie, the wand worked." Chapter Three: Ten Types of Noses. Let the boy go, Marco. Leonardo said again. But I caught him trying to steal my bird," said Marco. "No, Marco. The girl said they were setting him free," said Leonardo, "and I believe her." "Then let them pay me," the bird seller said. "We don't have any money," Annie said in a small voice. "I will take care of it," said Leonardo. He put down the basket he was carrying. It was filled with flowers, cheese, and a loaf of bread. He pulled out a gold coin. The bird seller let go of Jack and took the coin. Marco, when I lay in my cradle as a child, a bird flew down and struck me with its tail," said Leonardo. "Ever since then, I have wished." "I know, I know," interrupted Marco, "to be a bird yourself. You have told me this many times, Leonardo." The bird seller turned away to help a customer. Leonardo turned to Jack and Danny. "Yes," he said, "to be a bird myself." Which is why I often buy birds from Marco and set them free. So you see, my friends, you and I are kindred spirits. Yes, we are," said Annie, grinning. "Thanks for helping us," said Jack. He gave Leonardo a big smile. He wanted the great genius to like them, so they could spend the whole day with him. I'm Jack, and this is my sister Annie. Actually, it was Annie who freed. But Leonardo didn't give Jack a chance to finish. He kept talking. In truth, I love all creatures, every bird and animal known to man, and even the ones not known. He laughed heartily. Me too," said Annie. "Me too," said Jack. Leonardo picked up some bird feathers from the ground. "Ah, beautiful," he said, holding them up to the sun. "I will sketch these later." He tucked the feathers into his basket with the bread and cheese and flowers. Well, I must be on my way now, friends," he said. "Good day." Leonardo turned and began walking briskly away from the bird stand. "Oh no!" thought Jack. Before he could think of anything to say, Annie shouted, "Mr. Da Vinci, Leonardo!" Leonardo looked back at her. "Yes. Do you, um, do you need any help today?" Annie asked. Jack and I would really, really like to help you, all day somehow. Jack was embarrassed. He was sure Leonardo would say no, but to his surprise, the great genius was looking at them closely and tapping his chin. Well, actually, I am facing a great task this morning, he said with a smile. He nodded. Yes, perhaps you could be my apprentices just for today. Great," said Annie. "What's an apprentice?" asked Jack. "Apprentices help a master artist or skilled worker," said Leonardo. 
They work hard and study hard in hopes they'll become masters themselves some day. Cool," said Jack. "Come along then," said Leonardo. He started walking again. Jack and Danny hurried alongside him. They left the crowded market and started up a cobblestone street. "Do you children live in Florence?" asked Leonardo. "No, we're from um far away," said Jack. "We're here on a mission," said Annie. "We're looking for the secret of happiness." Leonardo smiled. "Ah, yes, I discovered that secret some time ago," he said. "You did?" asked Jack. "Yes, it's something I sought, and now I have it," said Leonardo. "It's really quite simple." "What is it?" said Jack. "The secret of happiness is fame," said Leonardo. "Really, fame?" said Annie. "Yes," said Leonardo. "When I look into the eyes of complete strangers." And see their awe and admiration. That makes me very happy. As Leonardo strode a few feet ahead of them, Annie looked at Jack. Fame, she said. I guess that's our answer. I don't know," said Jack in a soft voice. "Remember what the rhyme said. Though the question is quite simple, simple answers might be wrong." Oh yeah," said Annie. And the rhyme says that to learn the answer, we have to stay with him all day. Yep," said Jack. He didn't mind that part. Spending the day with one of the most amazing geniuses who ever lived seemed like a great idea. Jack and Annie followed Leonardo into a square with a huge cathedral. On the top of the building was the enormous eight-sided dome that they'd seen from the treehouse. How did anyone ever build that? Jack wondered. As hundreds of people moved about the square, Leonardo stopped. He stared into the crowd. "Oh, oh!" he said. "What? What?" asked Annie. "I see an angel," said Leonardo. "An angel?" said Jack. He looked at the crowd. He didn't see any angels. Over there, Leonardo pointed to a short, dark-haired girl standing by herself. The girl didn't look at all like an angel to Jack. She looked like an ordinary kid. Leonardo put down his basket. Untied a small book from his belt and pulled out a piece of chalk. He started to draw. "I have been seeking an angel for one of my paintings," he murmured as he sketched the girl. "I think I may have found her." In a moment, Leonardo was done. There, he showed his sketch to Jack and Danny. With just a few quick lines, he had created an angel. The drawing looked just like the real girl. Yet somehow she really did look like an angel now. That's the nicest angel I've ever seen," said Annie. "Hmm, I don't know," said Leonardo. "I fear the nose is not quite right. I'm afraid I must keep looking." He tore the page out of his sketchbook. "Perhaps you and Jack would like to have this." "Oh yes," said Annie. "Thank you." "I'll carry it," said Jack. He took the drawing from Leonardo and carefully slid it into his bag, between the pages of their research book. Leonardo put away his chalk and sketchbook and picked up his basket. "Come along," he said. Jack and Danny half walked and half ran, trying to keep up with Leonardo's long strides. "When I travel through the streets, I am always gathering information," Leonardo said. "I observe like a scientist. For instance." After years of observation, I now know there are ten different types of noses. Really? said Annie. She felt her nose. Yes, said Leonardo. Straight, round, pointed, flat, narrow. Of course, that is from the side. If you look people straight in the face, you will find eleven types of noses. No kidding, said Jack. Jack tried to get a good look at the noses they passed. He saw flat ones, round ones, straight ones, but many were hard to describe. My observations have also led me to conclude that there are many more types of mouths than noses," said Leonardo. "But the location of every mouth is almost always the same. It is halfway between the base of the nose and the chin." "Really?" said Annie. She held up two fingers, trying to measure the distance between her nose, mouth, and chin. I think you're right, Leonardo. 
I study people's expressions and gestures," said Leonardo. "I study their hands, their eyes, their hair. But to be a truly great artist, you must learn to combine your observations with your imagination." Suddenly, he stopped. "Look up! Look up!" Jack and Danny stopped and looked up. "See the clouds," said Leonardo. A few billowy clouds dotted the sky. "What do they look like to you?" asked Leonardo. "What sorts of things?" "Big white blobs," thought Jack. "The biggest one looks sort of like a castle," said Annie. "Good, good," said Leonardo. "And that little one looks like a dog's head," said Annie. "Like a Scotty puppy." "A Scotty puppy," thought Jack. He squinted, trying to see a puppy. "Excellent," said Leonardo. "And you, Jack? What about that one?" He pointed at a long cloud. "What do you see?" Jack studied it. "Uh, well, I guess it sort of looks like a boat," he said. "Wonderful," said Leonardo. "I get ideas for my paintings from everything. I look at a watermark on a wall and see an old woman's face." I look at a food stain on my tablecloth and see a horse. I study rain puddles and rocks and see oceans and mountains. Oh, I do that kind of thing too," said Annie. I imagine that the very first drawing might have been a simple line drawn around the shadow of a man on the wall of a cave," said Leonardo. "Wow," breathed Annie. "Pretty cool," thought Jack. He liked Leonardo's way of thinking. Listen now to the cathedral bells," said Leonardo. Jack listened. The bells played notes that went up and down, bong, bing, bong, bing. I hear the bells of voices as if they were singing to me," said Leonardo. "Can you hear what they are saying?" "Well, no," thought Jack. He just heard bongs and bings. They're saying, "You have much to do this Monday, Leonardo da Vinci. Get to work." Leonardo laughed. So let us be on our way, my friends. And the great genius took off, walking quickly through the streets of Florence. Chapter Four: Battle Scene. Jack and Danny hurried to keep up with Leonardo. So where are we going? Annie asked. To the palace of the Great Council, said Leonardo. I was hired to paint a fresco in the Council Hall. I have been working on it for months. What's a fresco? asked Jack. It is a work of art painted onto a wall, said Leonardo. One must spread plaster on the wall and then paint very quickly before it dries. Sounds like fun, said Annie. Not for me, said Leonardo. I believe great art requires much thought. I like to paint slowly and I change things as I go along. So for this fresco, I have invented a special oil paint. That dries very slowly. Does it work? said Jack. Too well, said Leonardo. Now I have a new problem. Neither the plaster nor my oil paints have dried at all. Oh no! said Annie. But today all will be well, Leonardo said cheerfully. I have a plan to speed up the drying process. This morning I will fix everything. Leonardo led Jack and Danny into a square. With a large building, there it is," he said, "the palace of the Great Council. The palace looked like a fortress. It had rough-looking stone walls and a tower that rose high into the air. The palace is a very important place," said Leonardo. "It is where the governing council of Florence meets. Come along." He opened one of the grand doors and guided Jack and Danny into a courtyard with a fountain. "This way to the council hall." He said, "And the latest work of Leonardo da Vinci." Leonardo bounded up some steps and down a corridor. Jack and Danny hurried after him until he passed another grand doorway and stopped. Leonardo put down his basket and raised his hands. "My fresco," he said. "Oh man!" breathed Jack. They were in an enormous room with tall arched windows and vast white walls. Several young men stood on a wooden platform on the far side of the room. On the wall above them was a giant painting of a battle scene. 
It showed a tangle of men on horseback fighting over a flag. The men in the painting seemed to be in a fury as they slashed at each other with their swords. Their faces were twisted, their mouths snarling. Even their horses looked wild and angry. The city has paid me to paint a scene from a battle once fought to defend Florence," said Leonardo. They wanted me to paint a scene of glory, but I believe war is a beastly madness. I hope my painting shows that. Oh, it does," said Annie. Jack nodded. It was the scariest painting he'd ever seen. Zorro called to Leonardo. One of the young men on the platform climbed down a ladder and jumped to the floor. He was a sturdy-looking teenager with a red face and wavy black hair. "Are things any better this morning?" asked Leonardo. "No, the paint is still very damp to the touch," said Zorro. "Then let us proceed with our plan," said Leonardo. "Did the pots arrive from the blacksmith?" "Yes, over there," said Zorro. He pointed at two large iron pots beneath the platform. "And you brought the wood," said Leonardo. "Yes," said Zorro. He pointed to a pile of wood stacked against a wall. Leonardo set down his basket and headed over to the platform. "What's the plan, Leonardo?" asked Annie as she and Jack followed him. "My apprentices and I will fill the pots with wood and lift them onto the platform," said Leonardo. "Then." We will light fires in them. The heat of the fires will quickly dry the fresco. How can we help? Asked Jack. Bring us some kindling, said Leonardo. No problem, said Jack. He put down his bag, and he and Annie hurried to the wood stack. Kindling? She said. Small pieces of wood, said Jack. They catch fire first and help get the big pieces started. Jack and Annie picked sticks and twigs from the wood stack. They carried the kindling back to Leonardo, and he dumped it into the iron pots. Zorro brought over some logs. Then he and Leonardo hooked the handles of the pots to a system of ropes and pulleys. "Pull!" Leonardo shouted. The apprentices on the platform pulled on the ropes. The heavy pots swung into the air. "Steady, steady!" Leonardo shouted. The apprentices slowly hauled up the pots. Then they pulled them onto the platform and placed them in front of the fresco. Light the fires! Shouted Leonardo. Zorro lit a candle from a torch burning at the entrance of the hall. He carried the candle up the ladder and used his fire to light the kindling. Soon the wood in the pots began to blaze. Bring more wood! Leonardo shouted. Bring more wood! Jack and Danny hurried back to the wood pile. They gathered bigger pieces of wood and rushed back to the ladder. Apprentices lifted the wood up to the platform and added it to the fires in the pots. Soon, flames were shooting high into the air, warming the fresco. Standing with Leonardo below the platform, Jack and Danny stared up at the battle scene. The room grew hotter and hotter, with the fires blazing above and smoke curling through the air. Jack felt like he was in the middle of the battle himself. He could hear the clanging swords, neighing horses, and shouting men. He could feel the beastly madness of war that Leonardo had talked about. Suddenly, Jack heard real shrieks. Leonardo's apprentices were all yelling. "It's dripping, master!" one cried. "The paint is running!" shouted another. Jack looked back at the fresco. The helmets of the warriors were melting down over their furious faces. Ah! cried Leonardo with a look of horror. Kill the fires! Kill the fires! Chapter Five. Knock knock. The panic of the battle scene seemed to spread through the big room. Leonardo's apprentices looked around wildly, as if they didn't know what to do. Water from the fountain! Leonardo roared. Hurry! He ran out of the room. His apprentices rushed after him. "We have to help too," Jack said to Annie. They took off after the others, following them down the stairs to the courtyard. The apprentices were filling buckets with water from the fountain. "Hurry, hurry, hurry!" Leonardo shouted. Jack and Annie grabbed two of the full buckets and clumsily followed the others back up the stairs. "This is like like Edo," Jack said to Annie. 
remembering their recent trip to old Japan. Yeah, said Annie. Except that was a city on fire. This is just paint melting. True, thought Jack. But Leonardo was acting like it was a matter of life and death. Inside the hall, Leonardo and the apprentices carried the buckets up the ladder. They splashed water over the flames in the two iron pots. But it was too late. The helmets and faces and swords of the fighting men had become a messy blur of streaks and blotches. The painting was ruined. Leonardo stared for a long moment at the wall. Then he climbed down the ladder and walked away. When he got to the door, Zoro shouted, "Master, wait!" But Leonardo kept walking. "We have to follow him," Annie said to Jack. "He seems really upset," said Jack. "I know," said Annie. "But we have to do what the rhyme says: help the genius all day long." "But what if he doesn't want our help any more?" said Jack. "Look, he forgot his basket with all his stuff in it," said Annie. "We can take it to him." Okay, good," said Jack. Annie picked up Leonardo's basket, filled with feathers, flowers, cheese, and a loaf of bread. Jack grabbed his own bag, and they hurried out of the council hall. When they got to the entrance of the palace, they saw Leonardo striding across the square. "Leonardo!" Annie yelled. Leonardo didn't look back. He disappeared down a narrow lane. "Quick!" said Jack. Jack and Annie took off across the square. When they got to the lane, they saw Leonardo at the far end. Leonardo, wait! Annie shouted. But Leonardo didn't wait. He kept going and rounded a corner. Annie and Jack ran faster. When they turned the corner, they looked right and left. Kids were playing in the street. Two women were leaning out of windows, talking to each other. But there was no sign of Leonardo. Excuse me, Annie called to the women. Have you seen Leonardo da Vinci? Oh yes, he just got home. One woman said, "He lives just over there." Said her neighbor. She pointed to a narrow building across the street. "Thank you," said Annie. She and Jack walked quickly to the building. A stone arch opened onto a wide pathway. They walked under the arch and down the pathway to a sunny cobblestone courtyard. A big white horse was tied to a cart. Chickens pecked the dirt between the worm stones. Hi guys," Annie said to the horse and chickens. Jack pointed to an open doorway across the yard. "He's in there. I hear him," he said. Annie and Jack moved quietly across the courtyard. They stopped outside a window. Leonardo was pacing up and down inside. His cap and cloak were on the floor. His hair was wild. "I'll leave Florence. That's what I'll do," Leonardo said to himself. "I shall go to Rome or back to Milan." Jack turned to Annie. We shouldn't bother him, he whispered. If I felt that bad, I wouldn't want people to bother me. Not bother, said Annie. Help! If I felt that bad, I'd want people to help me. Come on, at least we can give him his stuff. Before Jack could stop her, Annie stepped into Leonardo's room. Knock, knock, she said loudly. Leonardo whirled around. His face was red. He was scowling. What are you doing here? He said. We brought your things," said Leonardo. "You forgot them." She held up the basket. "Oh," Leonardo's face softened. "Thank you. Leave it all by the door, please," he said. Annie put the basket down. Then she looked up at Leonardo. "We better go," Jack said softly to her. "Wait." Annie stepped further into Leonardo's room. "We'd like to help you." She said, "Leonardo scowled again. You cannot help me," he said. "Do as your brother says, little girl. Go now." But Annie didn't move. "Excuse me, but we're supposed to help you all day," she said. "You made us your apprentices for the day, remember?" "Can you not see that I am miserable?" said Leonardo. "But why are you miserable?" said Annie. "You said that fame was the secret of happiness, and you're still famous." But what good is fame in the face of failure? Shouted Leonardo. This fresco was supposed to be my masterpiece. What good is fame when everyone will now laugh at me and mock my failure? Go, please. Oh, okay. I'm sorry," said Annie in a small voice. "We just wanted to help." She and Jack turned to go. 
Wait, 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 said Leonardo. Forgive me. Jack and Danny looked back at Leonardo. The great genius rubbed his face and signed. Then he waved his hand. Please forgive me. Come in, come in, he said. Thanks, said Annie. And she and Jack stepped inside Leonardo da Vinci's studio.